We're looking forward to it. Um, as, we, as we approach that, I'm always thinking about the act of baptism, the, the stories of baptism that we see in the Bible. So we, we head towards it, and I can't help but th- really think about what Jesus Christ did when he was baptized in the river by John the Baptist. I, I can't help but think of the other stories in Scripture that, that point to the act of baptism. And the one that I always land on and the one that I'm always fascinated by is the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian official, right? It is the story of, um, uh, of not just the Ethiopian eunuch, but it is the story of, of Philip. Now, if you guys remember how this took place, the, an angel spoke to Philip, which how many, just starting off, the story gets kind of, kind of like fascinating from the very get-go, right? An angel talked to Philip. And he said, I want you to go, and I want you to head towards Jerusalem. I want you to head towards Gaza. And there's this desert place, they said. And so the angel says to him, I want you to go to this desert place. Do you know what he does? He goes. He gets told to go to a desert place. He, he, is, he, he is encouraged to go. He doesn't know why he's going. They, they didn't explain it to him. They didn't, the, the, the angel didn't say, I want, he just was like, oh, okay, it's time to go. And so he gets up and he goes. And once he gets there, this is where he finds the Ethiopian eunuch. And recorded here in, 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 a, in the book of Acts, it says, he rose and went and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot and he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. And the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. Now, I want to stop there briefly because this is going to be important as we get into this. Remember what's taking place thus far for Philip. He has an angel tell him to go into the desert, and he says, okay, I'm going to go. So he goes. And he's just waiting around for what he's there for, right? Right? And as he gets there, he's like, oh, look at that. There's some guy from another country who looks weird and bizarre to me sitting in a chariot. And then the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God alive in him says, I want you to go and talk to him. Now, once again, I want you to take note of something. What does he do? He goes. So he follows what the Spirit of God is telling him to do, and he goes and he begins to have this conversation with this man. Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passive scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news of Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when he had come up of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Now, as I said, I love this story. I am fascinated by this story. You, You walk every step through it, and you just see the hand of God at work here, don't you? The angel speaks to Philip, says, I want you to go into this desert. Philip goes, cool, I'll go wherever you tell me to go. He shows up, and as he's there, he sees this guy. The spirit then speaks to Philip and says, I want you to go and talk to this strange guy. I want you to go. And Philip doesn't doesn't even hesitate. How many of us, when we feel the spirit of God speak to us, hesitate? He doesn't even hesitate. He runs. He runs to this guy. And it just so happens, it just so happens by some strange coincidence 
the Ethiopian eunuch is reading a prophetic word about Jesus Christ. How many of you so far are, are, are fascinated by the story because of the unbelievable move of the Holy Spirit all the way through this? He comes in, he happens to be, just happens to be reading about Jesus Christ. And so Phil, and, it, and then he turns, to, Philip goes, hey, what, do, you, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy just says, kind of just throws up the softball, right? He says, well, well how, can I, how can I, if somebody doesn't tell me, would you explain it to me? Like, who is he talking about here? Is he talking about himself or someone else? Philip must have been like, woo! Thank you, Jesus. And so he begins to walk him through the story of Jesus Christ. As he hears the story of Jesus Christ, he is so moved that in that moment, he turns to Philip and he says, man, what is to keep me from being baptized? And Philip's like, nothing. And so he goes into the water in that moment and he baptizes him into the church of Jesus Christ. And, it's, and the story kind of ends with another fascinating thing, right? He says, as soon as they came up out of the water, Philip was gone. Like he was transported, like Star Trek, taken from that moment somewhere else because because God was like, I've got a guy who wants to do my work. I got to I got to save time here. Right? This guy's going to preach Jesus to people, so I'm going to move him around. The entire story is amazing. The entire story is fascinating. Every time I come to th- and I think about baptism, I can't help but being brought into this. But every time I read it, every time I think about it, I, I kind of fear that this event can lead us down a path of thinking as it relates specifically to baptism that can be unproductive and untrue. I fear that the, the, the spontaneity of the baptism can undermine our understanding of the gravity of the act. And, and, and what I mean by that is as exciting as it is for this official of Ethiopia, that he was was moved in the moment to follow Christ in in the way of baptism, that quick response, I think, can fool people, can, can trick people into a view of baptism that betrays the depths of the commitment. That, that it betrays the depths of what it means when we stand up and we say, I follow Jesus. For many of us, I really fear that the act of baptism has become a religious rite, a, uh, a, a um, kind of vain act of our religiosity. And we've lost kind of what it means. And sometimes when we read this, we go, oh, wow, he was just kind of moved in the moment and he went. There was so much behind the act of baptism, the, the expectation, the, the implications, the, the commitment that was being declared in that act, specifically in the first century, that we need to embrace as believers and I say that whether, whether you are about to be baptized, whether you've been recently baptized, or you've been baptized for a long time, I think it's important for us to reflect on exactly what it means when we get into that water and we say, I follow Jesus. Think about this question. What are the true implications of following Christ in in baptism. What does it really mean? As you sit here, if you've been baptized, if you're contemplating being baptized, what does it really mean to you? Was it just a ritualistic act that you did? Or what was it you were declaring? What was it you were saying? And does it still have that meaning to you to this day? Robin M. Jensen, um, in their book, uh, Baptismal Imagery in Early Christianity, the Ritual, the Visual, and the Theological Dimensions, writes that there were five truths being expressed by the church 
and early baptism. First, baptism cleansed from sin and sickness, washing away external impurities and internal ones. Second, baptism conveyed the gift of the Spirit and his illuminating and sanctifying roles. Third, baptism proclaimed the church's hope for restoration in the new creation. Fourth, in being baptized, the new Christian experienced death to self and rebirth. And finally, baptism symbolized entrance in the community of saints, the church. In baptism, Christians became part of an exclusive group that functioned like a family and provided them with spiritual nurture and support. Now, as I read that, as I reflect on that, as I look at at what it was that the first century church understood about baptism, I question whether or not we understand baptism the way it was meant to be understood. As I read that, I really question whether or not I deeply understand what I meant by it when I stood up at seven, at, well, actually at 14 years of age with my mom and my dad and my brother and my sister, and we entered into the obedience of baptism. Do, does it convey for me the depth of what it's meant to convey? Does it carry for me the, the, the import that it was meant to carry? Think about each of these, not not simply as what was understood in the first century, but what is to be understood in every subsequent century for every believer. And I really fear that, that the levels are not very well understood or practiced in our current American expression of Christianity. Baptism expresses all that we have in Jesus Christ. It is the declaration of the depths of what Christ has done for us. Take the first statement as it relates to the institution of baptism from the very beginning. Cleansed from sin and sickness. The, the first century, as they walked into, that, into, that, into those waters of baptism, they made this understanding. They were declaring the fact that they were cleansed from sin and sickness. Baptism represents the act of the cleansing work of Jesus Christ from sin. The first century understood the depths of this representation, that they were cleansed from sin. Peter, Peter describes this in 1 Peter chapter 3. And I think it captures the understanding that, that the church had as they went to the waters of baptism. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that, we might bring us, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to them. Now, he, he, he hints there, he alludes here, very, I think very profoundly, to what the act of baptism is supposed to be about. He, sa- he says the act of baptism relates to Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. That Jesus Christ, who died, taking to the cross our sins, was then resurrected to new life. And he's saying, guys, you have to understand that when you go into the waters of baptism, the declaration you're making is you have been cleansed from sin and are being arised to new life. It represents that we are cleansed by sin, from our sin, in all of its expressions. Not just no longer the penalty of sin, but also the bondage of sin. See, for a lot of us, it's really easy for us to identify with the work of Jesus Christ who forgave me of my sins, this this spiritual act that takes place, right? Every single one of us who is a believer, whoever really gets the point of going into the waters of baptism, at least have this understanding of what salvation is. We kind of go, 
I was a sinner. I had the penalty of sin on me that, that because I sinned, I need to be forgiven. And so I go to the cross. I go to Jesus Christ. I believe on him. And now my sins are washed away. I am made clean. And I now am saved through the work of Jesus Christ. Right? We understand that, right? But what we've got to understand also is that the declaration isn't just about a spiritual act that we, that we love to identify with. But it is a declaration of a spiritual work that is ongoing, a spiritual commitment that we're making that is ongoing in our life and in our walk. It is not just about the penalty of sin, but it is also making a declaration about the bondage of sin. Why do I say that? Because in the very next verse, Peter makes this statement. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. You see what I'm saying? What I'm saying is we like to identify with this spiritual thing that Jesus did about my sin in the past. And so we see baptism as that. We go, oh, yeah, that, look at what Jesus did for me. He, he, he cleansed me of my sins. But what Peter is saying is coming out of the water, coming out of that baptism, the declaration we are making is I am washed from sin. I am no longer going to be a slave to the passions of my flesh. I am going to live in accordance with the Spirit of God alive in me and the law of Christ alive in me not by the power of my flesh or the law of my flesh. You follow what I'm saying? That the work of the, 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 that the act of baptism represents our declaration, not just what the Holy what Jesus did through the cross for us, but what we are doing continually in response to that work. If you're here today and you have entered into the act of baptism or you're going to enter into the act of baptism, you need to realize it's not just about saying I was cleansed from the sins in the past, but that I'm going to live in that cleanness. I'm going to live in that purity because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But what's interesting to me is that not only did they see this as a cleansing from sin, but they also saw it as a cleansing from sickness. I don't, I don't think it is coincidence that in the previous chapter we read Peter's words, quoting Isaiah 53, where he says, by your stripes we are healed. Or that he makes a declaration in chapter 3 that Jesus Christ, having gone to heaven, in the passage we just read, having gone to heaven, that authorities and powers are subject to him. See, he makes the declaration here, Peter does, as he's talking about the act of baptism, that what Jesus did in this is that Jesus went, when he, when he ended into heaven, he now has authority. He now has authority over powers. He now has authority over authorities. That Jesus Christ has the power, not just over sin, but also sickness. Amen. See, we, a lot of us here, it's, it, it's one of these things where, where, we, where we make this declaration and we can identify with, in the act of, of baptism with what, he, what Jesus Christ did on the cross to take away our sins. We can also kind of hear what I'm saying and go, yeah, he, yeah, you're right. That's a declaration that I'm going to continue forward with, with, with power over sin in my life. But the first century church understood the power of Jesus Christ to also break sickness in us. We have Jesus Christ alive in us as his children. And he has the healing power to make us whole. Many of us don't live in that reality. We continue to suffer without going to the cross, without going to him, without receiving prayer as the word of God directs us to. Jesus Christ has the power to heal. And unfortunately for many of us, what we do is, is we, we hear me say that. We read it in the word of God and we go, yeah, I, I, I understand that, but sometimes he doesn't heal. And I understand that, but 
Sometimes it's just his will that I'm continuing to be sick. Maybe. But what I do know is by his stripes we are healed. What I do know is that Jesus Christ has the power over all things. That he is sovereign over all things. And what I know is that the word of God tells me to come and be prayed for and receive healing. And you know what else I know? Is I have seen Jesus Christ heal. As people have been willing to step into that place, as people have been willing to press in even further and even deeper and say, Lord, I don't want to continue in this. I want to be healed. I say that because, because I can give you example after example after example after example in our body, in our church over the last six months of people who finally said, I am going to pray that God would heal me. People who have issues of blood for, 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 for years prayed for and healed. People who have had tumors prayed for and healed. People who have suffered for, for eight years, nine years with migraine headaches, got, people laid hands on them and they were healed. I shared with you guys um, a couple weeks ago the healing that took place in, in my wife's life. That for years now she has suffered with, with, with which what we believed was eating issues, with sensitivities. And so she's, had, so she's had headaches, she's had lack of sleep, she's had migraines, just suffered. So she, she kind of went and she just started doing all these, I got to eat this way, I got to eat this way. And it, and it was helping, but it was, it was burdensome and she would still get it on occasion. And what was fascinating is many of the times that she would have her worst headaches was after she was at church singing in worship and after she was engaged in ministry. And so she finally had fed up, was fed up with it, and I shared this with you, that she finally had people lay hands on her and pray for her, and she was healed. You know what's fascinating, though, is the Sunday I shared that with you guys, the very next day, she ended up with the worst migraines she's had and the least amount of sleep she had had in weeks, maybe months. But she believed that Jesus Christ wanted her to receive healing. And so she continued to pray and she got some people to lay hands on her and pray for her. And they prophesied over her and they said, this is an attack of the enemy and we are just going to continue to pray. And you know what we did? We continued to pray and she received prayer from other people and now it's ever since then it's completely gone away. And she is completely whole. And here's the reality. Jesus Christ heals. What the word of God says is that he has power and authority over all things. And I find it fascinating that in the first century when they went into the waters of baptism and came up, it wasn't just a declaration that there was a cleansing from sin, but there was a declaration that through the power of Jesus Christ there is a cleansing from sickness too. We need to live in the faith and believing that Jesus Christ is a healing God. And we need to realize that when we went into the waters of baptism, that was a part of our declaration, and we should live in the truth of that reality. Secondly, they understood, and it relates to what we just said, but they understood that that the, the act of baptism was a declaration that they conveyed the gift of the Spirit and his illuminating and sanctifying role in our lives. That when they came out of the, out of the water of baptism, they saw it very much in the same way in which when Jesus Christ came out of the waters of baptism and it said the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove. That it is the declaration that in me entering... In, into salvation, I have the Holy Spirit alive in me. I've stated this before, if you've been in the church for any period of time, one of, the, one of the consistent declarations of the first century was, we serve a living God. Not one made with the hands of men, not one of stone, not one of wood, that this was a declaration all throughout the church's history because it was a declaration that God is still alive. He's not like all the idols out there. And the expression of our living God is the Holy Spirit at work still in us. 
It is the declaration that Jesus Christ, through his spirit, is in you, that he is here to comfort you, that he is here to convict you, that he is here to lead you into all truth, that he is here to guide you every day. And every declaration I just made comes directly from the word of God about the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. He is here to convict you of your sin. He is here to comfort you. He is here to lead you into all truth. How many of you see your life as a believer living that reality? The Spirit of God is here now. The Spirit of God is in you when you walk out those doors. The Spirit of God is there for you as you get into your car. The Spirit of God is there for you as you get up in the morning to go to work. The Spirit of God is there alive in you. And the question is, are you living in the reality of the Spirit of God alive in you? Are you listening? Are you pressing in? Are you following? We see this in our story, right? That's why I said I want you to take note of this. Philip was in this place in his life where I'm telling you, every one of us as believers are supposed to be. Philip was in this place in his life where he's just like, he wakes up in the morning, he's like, all right, Lord, what's the mission today? And so God sends an angel and says, I want you to go into the desert. He's like, all right, time to go to the desert. Don't know why, don't know what I'm going to see there, but it doesn't matter because God is leading me. He goes. Now he's there standing in the desert and he sees this weird guy off there odd person. He's from Ethiopia. He's probably dressed odd and weird. He's got a whole group of people around him. And then all of a sudden, now, how how did he, what, what does it say happened next? The Spirit spoke to him. How many are you, how many of you are consistently in a place where you're saying, the Spirit of God is alive in me, speaking to me. I want to hear the Spirit, and I want to move as the Spirit tells me to move. So there's that, there's that, the, the first part of challenge, I think, for each of us. Are we actively in this place where we realize the Spirit of God is alive in me and he's speaking to me and I want to be open to it, I want to be hearing it. But not just that, not only does he hear the Holy Spirit, he does, didn't do what I do all the time. Which is, well, that guy, well, he kind of looks weird though. I mean, there's all these guys standing around him. And it's like, he's really, probably really important. I'm like, this is probably just me thinking, like, I should do something. And so then I get in the car and I go and watch a baseball game. And I never go and talk to the Ethiopian eunuch and I never have the opportunity to, 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 to uh, coincide with him reading Isaiah, who then asks you this ridiculous question that then gives you the opportunity to lead him to Jesus. Am I the only person who does that? What he did is he heard the Spirit of God speak to him, and he ran to the guy. Nothing mattered. The Spirit of God was alive in him. The Spirit of God was leading him. And so he went where the Spirit of God sent him. When you went into the waters of baptism, your declaration was, the Spirit of God is alive in me and working in me. How many of us continue to live in that declaration? God has something unbelievably beautiful for the followers of Christ. It begins with his spirit alive in you. Too many of us live a boring boring Christian life. We, we, We live a lame Christian life. We live a depressed Christian life because we don't live alive to the spirit of God in us, leading us and guiding us. He has more for you. Your declaration at baptism was that the Spirit of God is alive in you. And if you, and if you follow Jesus in the waters of baptism in two weeks, that will be your declaration. And I would call you, live the truth of that declaration. God is alive in us by the power of his Holy Spirit. The third declaration that the first century church was making as it related to baptism 
was it was proclaiming the church's hope for the restoration in the new creation. One of the realities embraced deeply by the, friend, by the first century church is a conviction that I believe is merely a vague idea in our current American Christian consciousness. They believe deeply that there is the promise of a new creation through Jesus Christ. And this is a twofold idea. Not only in the, in the very personal, that we are new creations in Jesus Christ, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5. For many of us, that's an easy one for us to embrace, that we see that, and it's a very personal thing. It's a very personal idea, and we, we, we push towards that. We are new creations in Jesus Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new, right? Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Probably many of us as Christians have quoted that over and over again. But that's not the extent to which the, the first century church was making that declaration. They understood something very, very deeply that we don't seem to even ever touch on. It's not just about that personal new creation, but that he is going to restore all things, that this world, this life is temporary, and we have a hope in the restoration of all things. How many of you even understand what I'm talking about as it relates to this? That the promise of Jesus Christ is not simply for what he does in your life and then you die and you go on to heaven, but that he has promised that there is a new earth and a new heaven coming. That there is a new restoration coming. That this place isn't long for this place. That this world isn't the final statement, isn't the final declaration. And that when we as Christians invest ourselves in this, we are investing ourselves in something that has no future. It's interesting because it's Peter again who says in 2 Peter these words. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you be in, the, in, in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. What you need to understand is that when we go to the waters of baptism and come up, yes, it is about the declaration of the new creation that we have in Jesus Christ in our own lives, but the first century understood very deeply that this world is melting away. That this world has no future. That this world is not what we care about, what we invest in, what matters. What did Peter say? He said, with this being true, how then should we live, brothers? What he's saying is, we don't invest in this stuff. We don't care about this stuff. Because it is melting away and Jesus Christ is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And I want you to understand how they understood it. That was their hope. See, for many of us, we live hopeless. We live depressed. We live just making it through to the next church service. Because this world is so hard and difficult. The declaration of the first century church was, yeah, this world's so hard and difficult. It's going to be gone. I live for Jesus. I live for the next tomorrow. I live for the new heaven. I live for the new earth. Of course this place sucks. It's run by broken people in broken institutions looking for broken answers to broken problems. 
but there is a new heaven and a new earth coming, a new creation. And when I come out of these waters, it doesn't just represent the newness that I have, but it is the newness that is coming, and I live for Jesus and not for this place. That's the declaration every time you go into the water and come out. That's the declaration you made. See, for many of us, we live in a place that is not in alignment with our baptism. The declaration of baptism reveals the depths of conviction for the believer that cannot be taken lightly. That the work of Christ to bring redemption from sin and, and freedom from sickness, to provide the Holy Spirit to empower, to encourage, to transform, and to proclaim that our faith is not in the things of this world, but, in both, it, it, but both in the ongoing and future restoration that comes through Jesus Christ. Regardless of when or how you come to obedience in Christ through the act of baptism, I want to remind you that this is what you are declaring. That everything I have is about him. Everything I do is for him. Every hope I have is in him. That's it. And I think it's important for us to note that I don't think the Ethiopian eunuch, even in his spontaneity, did not carry these convictions with him to the waters of baptism. Church father Arrhenius of Lyons wrote in his work against the heresies this of the Ethiopian official. This man was also sent into the regions of Ethiopia to preach what he had himself believed, that there is one God preached by the prophets, but that the son of this God had already made his appearance in human flesh and had been led as a sheep to the slaughter and all the other statements with the prophets made regarding him. Church history tells us that he became one of the great missionaries back into his home. And even some tell us he died a martyr for his faith. There is a new life in Christ Jesus for those who believe and follow him. The old has passed away and is passing away. If you believe that, then you follow him in baptism. And if you have followed him in baptism, you need to live the conviction of that declaration. It is not a vain act of religiosity, but it is a belief that you have been made new, your sin is washed away, your healing has come and is coming. It is the belief that, that the Holy Spirit is alive in you and leading you and guiding you every single day of your life and that there is a hope for a new life, a new heaven, and a new earth through Jesus Christ. Is that what baptism means to you? If not, let's reawaken the conviction of our commitment.